actually, I'm, I'm particularly honored to be giving a talk on Martin Luther King Day. I, as you might imagine, I give talks a lot, uh, but I've never actually given a talk on Martin Luther King Day. So I'm really uh, pleased to be a part of this special day um, with all, all of you. And in, in thinking about it, I thought maybe I'd like to try to do something different today from my normal talks, which is giving you somewhat of a formal talk. Rather, I'd like to speak a little more freely, a little more personally, uh, because of the nature of this particular day. Um, if I do that, though, I need two ground rules. Um, one is that you understand I'm not speaking on behalf of my organization. Uh, obviously, it will connect to my work, but I'm going to give you my views, uh, which may or may not be the same as the views of our board members and all of our members and so forth. So, so if you'll let me do that. Number two is um, if we can try to follow the rule of, uh, because I'm speaking somewhat off, off my head, uh, try to listen to what I'm trying to say, even if the words aren't perfect, OK? Um, so there we go. So I will, um, within those rules, um, link it to the theme and link it to the work that I've been pursuing now for the last 15 years or so, uh, which is the Stars of the Network. Uh, and our theme, uh, freedom to think, uh, responsibility to act. Freedom to think, responsibility to act. Um, if you want to, in my mind, that theme really has a question mark uh, after the second part. Freedom to think, is there a responsibility to act? Uh, and I invite you to see that question mark in your mind, to hear it, uh, and decide for yourselves your answer. Obviously, I, I have an answer, and I'll, I'll share that with you. Um, but um, first, let me say, um, how did I get here? How did I get to be doing what I do uh, with Scholars at Risk, and how did I get to be invited to give a speech uh, on Martin Luther King Day? Uh, and I was thinking about that, and the answer connects to a question I get all the time, which is, is how did you get into this work? How did you get into human rights and so forth? And if you work in the human rights community, and that's where I would say Scholar Risk is anchored, our, our job is to link higher ed and human rights, um, you meet an enormous number of people. In fact, the vast majority that I have met uh, in doing this work around the world, where they're engaged in this because they have personally experienced, or a family member of theirs, they personally experienced the rights violation. Uh, and they have made it their life's work to push through that pain or to seek justice on behalf of uh, those who have suffered in that experience. Uh, and I really respect that and I honor that, and so I specifically say, I'm not one of those people. Um, if you get a chance to meet those people, I urge you to, because they're really inspiring, uh, and the world is full of them, uh, and they're out there doing wonderful work. Um, my experience of being asked that question a lot, I had to dig in and say, okay, why did I get into this work? Where did, where did it come from? Uh, and so if you'll bear with me, I think ultimately it, it, it comes back to a story um, when I was about 10 years old, uh, and I was on a little community you know, school basketball team, uh, and we had a saint of a coach who took all kinds of abuse from us, and also drove us all over the place in his beat up station wagon. Uh, and I lived far away from the school as well as one other teammate. Uh, so when he was driving us home from the games, all of the kids, 10 or 12 kids, squeezed into the station wagon. The noise, unbelievable. Uh, to my mind now as a parent, looking back. At the time, I didn't hear the noise at all, of course. Um, but normally, I would get dropped off last. But on one particular trip, they dropped us off first because of where we were coming from. And the team was made up of some kids that I went to school with and some kids from the community. And if you'll forgive the word, but at the time, what we said was kids from the project. Uh, and because this is Martin Luther King Day, I think it's important to say there was a racial line there as well. So it was mostly the black kids that did the project and the white kids who lived in these other places. Uh, and I knew where they lived because we tended to drop them off first and then we go to my house. They had never seen where we lived. We got to my neighbor's house, and pulled into the driveway, and the noise went away. And one of the kids in the car said, wow, that's a big house. And I heard it, and I said to myself, my house is the same size. And I never thought it was a big house. Now, I don't know what they said when I got out of the car, because I got out next and they went home. But I assume they had the same reaction to my house. And that stayed with me. Because even though I knew where they lived and I knew where I lived, and I had seen the difference. Until I heard that through that kid's eyes, I didn't know I lived in a big house. And I think that opened something. It was a fact that didn't fit with the values that I was being raised with. How do you connect the values of trying to be a good, person in the world with the difference of your house versus that house. Because morally speaking, that 10-year-old and me were equal, the same, no difference. So I think I got into the work somehow because of that. And 
for the years after that, I didn't really consciously, but was trying to pursue somehow to reconcile facts with values. I didn't want to abandon the values I was given, but I didn't want to ignore the facts that weren't fitting with them. So when I got into college, uh, I suppose naturally, somehow that got me gravitating towards Dr. King and Gandhi. And I wrote my thesis in undergrad uh, on Dr. King and, and Gandhi. So that's again why I'm delighted to be uh, speaking at an MLK event. Uh, after college, that brought me to China, where I happened to be there during Tiananmen, uh, to Guatemala and Chile uh, at the time of Pinochet. I've also brought me to Harlem and to the South Bronx and bed -Stuy. eventually to law school, and eventually to the University of Chicago, where we started the scholarships. And the last time in Martin Luther King Day, at least, or another time, was on my first year out there, there was a Martin Luther King Day event at the University of Chicago. And for those that don't know, Chicago's on the uh, University of Chicago is on the south side of Chicago, obviously a real um, important place for the civil rights movement in this country, also very close to the headquarters of Jesse Jackson's organization. And Jesse Jackson was supposed to be the keynote speech of the giant cathedral at the University of Chicago on Martin Luther King Day. I was really excited, everybody was really excited. It's a big symposium like you guys are all doing today. Um, unfortunately, Reverend Jackson had to cancel just before the event. So they brought in a second string, a young state senator uh, and lecturer, um, Barack Obama. And I can tell you, I'm making a huge mistake now as a speaker on Martin Luther King Day to tell you that he was a speaker on Martin Luther King Day, and I guarantee you a great speech. It was a really incredible, moving speech that reminded me again why I got into this work. Uh, not in the same words, but basically reminded me that I live in a big house. Uh, and there's responsibilities that come with living in a big house if you seek to reconcile that with values and justice. Uh, and so, partially because of that event, as we dug into the work, I began to realize through our work at Scholars at Risk that all of us here live in a big house. Because anyone who has access to higher education is in the big house. Because on the earth today, fewer than 50% of the people on the planet have a chance at higher education. That means billions of people don't have the opportunity that we have to be in this room, to engage with ideas, to have the love of to exchange ideas and culture. So all of us, in that sense, are in the big house. And I actually, because of the way my mind works, I went and did the math on all human beings who have ever lived. So not just alive now, but in the past, and it's less than 10%. All of humanity has the chance that all of us have by being in this space. So, so all of us live in the big house. Um, and so then the question is, how do we reconcile that fact with values to bring justice uh, into the world. And to some degree, I think on a personal level, my um, gravitating somehow into the work of Scholars at Risk is an attempt to reconcile that, uh, the fact with the values and bring justice. And I think on a larger view, Scholars at Risk is about bringing the higher education together to its responsibility of bringing justice because the higher education community is a big house. Yeah. So I want to come back to that, but first I guess let me explain what uh, scholars have written to oh, I'm sorry. This is not obviously relevant to what we're talking about, but I'll put it up for you. Um, <coughs> scholars at Risk is a network. A network of universities, colleges, higher education institutes, and individuals. And, and the slides that I'm going to turn on now, and then you'll see I won't refer to it at all, uh, are quotes from either cases of people that we've tried to help, or the people in our network who have helped them. Uh, and so it's my way of showing you that when I stand here, I'm representing thousands of people around the world. Um, that it's not just me, okay? So these are not my quotes, they're not my words. These are the people in the network, either those who have needed help or those who have, have given help. So we're a network and our mission is to, um, on the simplest level, protect uh, scholars, promote academic freedom, defend the higher education space against violent and coercive attacks. So that's our, our basic mission. Understanding that at a, at a deeper level, and in some ways a simpler level, our work is about protecting the space for thought. The space to be able to ask questions without fear. Uh, and so, um, well, how many people right now, I want to show of hands, are afraid that after this talk, we're going to get arrested? How many people have any belief that I might get arrested at least? None, right? Well, that's normal for us. That is a luxury in many, many places. 
So an example quickly, which is uh, in Zimbabwe in 2011, uh, at the time that the Arab Spring broke out, uh, and we saw democratic uh, movements trying to overthrow dictatorships in North Africa. Uh, some professors in uh, Zimbabwe organized a screening of videos of what was going on in Egypt and Tunisia. And they organized a discussion on campus, just like discussions that will go on today about a video and what do you think of this and so forth and so on. Uh, but in Zimbabwe, things are different. Uh, and so the police surrounded the building. Uh, the only reason they didn't come straight into the building was because there was a security guard who refused to unlock the door. Uh, and in my mind, I don't know, but in my mind, it's, it's an uneducated security guard who we would not often think of as actually part of our community, but clearly is and was clearly a defender of the community at that moment. Uh, but ultimately, they did come in. They arrested 45 people, including students and the lecturers and others. Uh, they kept them in jail, the students, for 16 days and ultimately released 39 of them held six of them, the professors and, and other leaders, uh, for much longer, prosecuted them and so forth. So, so the fact that we have this space to think, uh, to open, to ask questions, um, is something that, that doesn't exist everywhere. And that's why our, our network exists. Um, how often does this happen? Um, shockingly often. The scope of attacks uh, on the higher education space is immense. Um, that's one of the facts that I'm talking about. The question is how do we reconcile with that with our values that knowledge is important, that higher education is important. So on the one hand, we have this fact that the attacks are immense. Someone, our values tell us, should do something. How do we reconcile that? So option one is we say it's a shame, there's nothing I can do, and we leave it and hope others will deal with it. Option two is we do what we can. And this is the ethos behind scholars of risk, that the higher ed sector should do what it can. Now, we have a sort of saying in the offices, we know we can't do everything, but we do what we can. It doesn't mean you have to do everything, do what you can. And that's the way that our network, by bringing people together, has been able to, to achieve a lot. Jeff already alluded to what kinds of attacks um, we're talking about, life and liberty attacks primarily. So in the Zimbabwe case, we're talking about liberty attacks, people being imprisoned. Uh, there's also very serious cases of, of people losing their lives. But I also do want to flag that there are other less violent forms of attacks and pressures on this space, including pressures on funding, retaliation for publishing certain things, and so forth and so on. And while Scholar at Risk doesn't work directly on those issues, they are connected to our work. Because when we defend against the serious, most egregious violations, we also open the space up and push back against the, the less severe violations. Uh, let me give you a sense of the scope in the sense that we have a what we call our monitoring project. And this is a project, by the way, that faculty supervising students can participate in from anywhere in our network. Uh, and what it is is keeping your eyes and ears open for reports of incidents of attacks on the higher education space. We have 19 monitors around the world currently working on our project. And in the last year alone, they documented over 167 incidents in 56 countries affecting over 5,000 victims and 400 perpetrators. So the scope uh, is there. Who, who does these attacks? Well, state actors, yes. I think a lot of us would tend to think state actors, and in the Zimbabwe case it was. But also non-state actors are also a significant uh, portion of the problem. Uh, and it depends really on where, where we are and what the situation is. So another example. Uh, we have a scholar from uh, Latin America who works on uh, researching the intersection between government corruption and narco traffic. Do I need to explain why that would get dangerous? Uh, needless to say, they don't want their names in a report that will get published to say these people are connected to these people and both of them are breaking the law. Uh, so this scholar would experience direct individual targeted violence and our job would be to try to help, help that person be safe where they are and if they can't be safe where they are, get them to a place where they could be safe. That's an individual case. Then we have more crisis cases where large numbers of individuals are all threatened at the same time. And those fall into acute circumstances, which are sort of temporary issues. Uh, a good example here would be a few years ago in Kenya, people may remember, a place where everybody thought things were really quite stable and good, all of a sudden erupted into terrible violence around an election. Uh, and it turns out that simmering ethnic violence underneath the colonial structures was always there and it, it broke up. And because of that, a lot of people uh, were targeted, a lot of scholars included were targeted, 
Um, but there was a reasonable hope, and it has turned out to be true, that once people were able to be safe for a while in a different place, they were ultimately able to return. Uh, so that was an acute crisis. And then we have chronic crisis, which today all of us would be able to see in the circumstances of Iraq and Syria, where we have massive displacement uh, and really no reasonable way to project when everything will be better. And so we have different strategies for, for dealing with those types of circumstances. Why, why do we bother and why have we organized this network to try to, to deal with this? Um, first and foremost, the easy answer is solidarity, um, and because we can. So as members of the higher education community, we have an opportunity to be able to assist our colleagues, and it doesn't take a lot from us, and it's literally in many cases life-saving to them, so we should. And as Jeff mentioned, now it's 400, actually over 500 now, cases in the history of our network have been relocated and given safety in our network. Another thousand other scholars have gotten help in some way. 70 roughly scholars alone last year uh, received help through the network in the relocation center. Um, so, so that's the, the surface level answer as to why we should help, but there's a deeper answer also as to why all of us should care, why all of us should help, and that I think is because of why many scholars are attacked. Um, and so again, an example, how many people in the show have ever heard of uh, Cheng Wong Chen, uh, the blind lawyer from China? So this case was in the papers in the last couple of years, but so to remind every, all of us, so this is a um, self-educated lawyer again, self-educated, not through the official processes. Um, also blind, um, so self-educated blind lawyer in China who uh, took on representation of cases of families and people who were badly hurt by either corruption or mismanagement of the government and so forth in China. Because of this, he became uh, essentially branded a dissident, a troublemaker, and so forth, put under house arrest and so forth, and eventually he manages to to navigate himself secretly into the American embassy. Uh, and it becomes a major international incident between China and the United States and so forth. He ultimately comes out of China and that's how that incident dissipates. But the question is, why did China care so much? Why does a global power the size of China care that this one self-educated blind individual enough to make an international incident out of it with the global superpower of the United States? And I think the, the answer is um, not clearly because Cheng Wong Chen or the other famous dissident, Hu Xiaobo, the Nobel, Prize, the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize winner who's in prison in China right now, not because they hold any traditional power. Right? They have no military. They have no large amounts of money or capital base with which to overthrow the government. Scholars operate in the realm of ideas. They operate in narratives. They operate in essential values like justice and truth, just like Dr. King. And when scholars are willing to suffer the consequences of standing at the intersection between ideas and truth on the one hand and coercive force on the other, they can be extremely threatening to regimes. But if you get what I'm saying, scholars like uh, Cheng Wang Chen, like Du Xiaobo, they stand at the intersection between coercion being the way that decisions are made, between threats, between imprisonment or violence, and the truth of ideas and research and evidence being the way I, uh, outcomes are decided. And so what they can do is by willing to take the suffering, they can expose the limits of coercive power. Again, like Dr. King, and before him, Gandhi. So, so in addition to solidarity, we should be helping these people because they are on the front lines of defending the space for thought. And all of us have a common interest in expanding that space because all of us want to be able to think. How many of us as Americans, it's almost innate to think we have our right to say what we want, right? It's almost absurd. We never have the conversation about it. We're able to think what we that's what this tug of war um, is all about. We have a common interest in seeing humanity shift from coercion being the way decisions are made to ideas and evidence and resource and discussion and debate. Now, can we make a difference on this? Because this is obviously one of the age-old tensions between power and ideas. Can we actually make a difference? And the answer, I'm pleased to say, of course, is yes. Another example comes again from the Arab Spring, but not this time people watching it, but people in it. 
uh, in particular in um, Tunisia. Now obviously the West, the United States, we have an enormous interest in seeing that when these countries go through these transitions, something becomes stable in a way that respects rights, that isn't threatening internally, but also externally to the rest of the world. So, so the Arab Spring, I think we can say, is important to all of us. Uh, and so after pressures against the university space in Tunisia during this time, we, Scholars at Risk, started to get engaged, trying to defend this space that was being fought over um, in Tunisia. And in particular, what was happening is external pressure groups were trying to tell the university what they could teach, who they could teach, when and how they could teach. In other words, they knew at this revolutionary moment in their society, they knew that controlling this space is a way to control the future of the society. And they were using physical violence and physical coercion against one particular campus to make that happen. So we went and we started working together and we held events in New York and we held events in Tunisia and elsewhere. And we went and during one of my visits, I was there and I was actually meeting with the dean who has become the focal point of this pressure. His name is Dean Habib Kazdagwe. He's a wonderfully courageous man. And um, one of the nights I was there, there happened to have been some, some violence. This was a few weeks after, some of you may recall, um, these same pressure groups had stormed the U.S. Embassy uh, and threatened to burn the U.S. Embassy. They did burn a portion of it. They burned a neighboring American school. So the level of violence was very uh, real. And so anyway, we were out one night and the government declared a curfew, which means everyone had to be home by a certain amount of time. Uh, and as you can imagine, these aren't always the most well-planned things. So the curfew was announced something like 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and everybody had to be home at 7 o'clock. Uh, and so people are literally racing across the town, and so they threw me into a taxi, and, and we're racing across town, I'm sitting next to the, um, the dean, and they're all in the car, and at one point we're stuck in traffic because, of course, everyone is trying to get home. Uh, and then I can, there's an argument going on between one of my colleagues and the dean, and basically I'm trying to piece it together, but basically they're telling him to put his head down. Uh, and it turns out it's because we're stuck in traffic directly in front of the mosque where the young man that had been storming his university mostly hung out. Uh, and they were afraid that if they saw him trapped in the car right in front of them that it could lead uh, to a violent situation. Uh, the dean refused to put his head down, uh, and eventually we were able to move forward. I didn't appreciate really how dangerous that was for him, and, and I suppose indirectly for the rest of us, but for him, until I found out later that that actually was the mosque where the attack on the embassy was organized. So at that space they had organized trucks and ropes and petrol bombs and so forth and gone on to attack the embassy. So it was entirely feasible that if they saw him in his car, but I think it was, it was an example of his courage that he refused to hide. Uh, and he then has led his university in that way and has refused to back down. Uh, and so we tried to intervene to assist him. And ultimately, in the sort of Alice in Wonderland way these things work sometimes, he became the, the subject of being prosecuted. Uh, and so we intervened with the government when he was being prosecuted and made sure there was massive international attention on this trial. And ultimately, that made the government change their position. Originally, they were saying it was his fault. I met literally with the Minister of Education told me it's his fault. Uh, and after international intervention, the government's position switched over and said, well, he's actually doing a good job. Uh, so that, that's an example of where we were able to help. And then um, we organized an international conference, and we brought lots of people to Tunisia to talk about the university and the nation, and why the Tunisian people should be paying attention to this fight over this space, because it's so important to the future of their society. And ultimately, we were pushing for legal protection for the values of the university. And as a sign that I think it's helpful, I think our work was helpful to local advocates. And I want to say, our work was not the decider. It was the local people, always the decider. But we can help reinforce that work. And in this case, we were able to, and last week, you may, if any are following it, Tunisians in the process of adopting a new constitution. And last week, they approved by an almost, almost unanimous vote, an article that explicitly protects academic freedom and university autonomy and research in Tunisian constitution, making it only one of 20 or 21 countries in the world that have explicit protection in their constitution. So these are, these are small, but I think also important steps to say how outside interventions um, can help. What does this mean for all of us? What does, what does our working in Tunisia have to do with us and understand that? college. 
Um, I think it has to, the answer to that comes from what do we see as the role of the higher education space in society. And that was the theme of our conference, the university and the nation. What does the nation owe to the university, to the higher education space? And our answer is they owe security, meaning protection, they owe respect for autonomy, they owe respect for academic freedom. But then the question flips. What does the university, what does the higher education space, what do all of us as educators or as students or as alumni or as members of the community around a higher education space, what do we owe to society? And I think that ultimately boils down to the same question that I started out with, which is, what are the responsibilities of living in a big house in a society where we know justice is not perfect? What are our responsibilities? And I think the answer for the university should be the same answer, I think, for us as individuals, which is, number one, as higher education space, we need to seek truth. That is why we're here. We need to seek knowledge the best we're able to get. I don't pretend for our philosophy friends that there may be an absolute, but we need to seek the best that we can get. We have to exercise the freedom to think that we have, because as I said in the Zimbabwe example, so many don't have it. We have to exercise it as best we can, take advantage of this wonderful opportunity that we have. And then, I think we have to go through the difficult challenge of reconciling the truth that we discover, the facts that are inconsistent with the values that we say we want to live by in a world where we know there is imperfect justice. Universities are microcosms of the societies in which they exist. This is a wonderful thing. At a minimum, then, that means they are called to be rights respecting entities. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, what would we think of when we think of Augustana College? What do we think of when we talk about a higher education community? We think of a place where access is based on merit, right? Hopefully we are through the debate about who should get access on any criteria other than merit. Uh, and we work very hard to make sure that our communities are broad and inclusive because we know that more truth a closer truth comes from having a broader group in the process of discussing and debating that truth. And then once people are in this space, we make sure they have adequate housing, we make sure they have adequate health care, we make sure they have adequate food. All of the basic human rights that we talk about all around the world are in our space. So we are a rights-based space already. And I think we are demanded, we're demanded at least to be rights respecting in that sense, to treat anyone who comes into this space with that full panoply of rights. I also think we have a higher quality. I think taking care of the people who are in your big house is important, but it doesn't fully answer the responsibility of someone who lives in a big house. I think our higher education spaces also have a responsibility to be rights promoted to be engines of human rights and justice in society. So I will put a, a giant caveat and footnote. There are ways to do that. There are methods that are appropriate to a higher education space that are different from methods from an NGO space. I know that. Universities, I'm not saying they need to be activists in the, in the human rights NGO sense. I am saying, though, that they need to be active. Um, and what I say this comes from is the fact that our institutions like this don't exist in a vacuum. One of the cases that we um, had approach us, one of the scholars, he approached us, he didn't want to leave his country, he approached us for money, for offense. He worked in Uganda at a university in northern Uganda, and the problem was that the warlords kept coming down into, from the north down, and raiding the campus, and literally just looting whatever they could get. And he couldn't build a stable infrastructure because they, they kept cutting the fence open. And he wanted to build a really, really good wall to protect this space. We don't have to worry about that because the conditions around our space are good for what we're trying to do. I think as higher education uh, communities, we have a responsibility to defend the conditions from which we grow, the, con the background conditions of human rights that we have the luxury of taking advantage of here but everyone, every, all of our colleagues in higher education around the world and don't have. So I think universities have an obligation to be rights promoting in how they carry themselves in the world and to recognize responsibilities to, to colleagues in other parts of the world. What does this mean? This means when we enter into partnerships across boundaries, we need to bring our values with us. 
I'm by no means saying we shouldn't have those progress centers. We should. Our program is entirely pro-engagement. The choice is not engage or not engage. The choice is do we engage with our values as a central part of the partnership, or are we not talking about the values on difficult questions uh, because it's too complicated to, to seal the partnership while we bring those issues up? So tactics matter. The process of how we do this matters. But at the end of the day, also the values matter. And scholars matter, and higher education matters, and I think we need to do what we can as communities to promote these. By supporting higher ed communities and individuals in China, and in Tunisia, and in Mexico, and beyond, I think we all benefit. By joining our network, by showing solidarity with other institutions around the world, and especially by hosting scholars, either for events or for, for six month or one year visits, I think higher education communities send a message that benefits them. I think they send a message to their own constituency, to their own leadership team, to their faculty, to their students, to their alumni, to their administration. They send a message about what are the values of their institution. And I think that message says that we are rooted in the pursuit of truth. We are rooted in uh, values. We will go out of our way to help defend the space for thought and questioning, and we will go out of our way to help those who are threatened for doing that and for using that space. And I think when we, when we send this message, we put our values um, into action. I think we meet the responsibility that comes with living in a big house and helping to bring more justice into an imperfect world. And so I can't think of a better way uh, to work with people to spend our time on, uh, and I'm really honored to be able to work with all of the people that I do work with, and some of them were there. And I thank all of you for inviting me to be here with you. It's been an honor, and I really look forward to the rest of the day and to sharing and to learning and to celebrating this, this special day together. Thank you. It seems to me that, that your work might overlap a little bit or intersect with the state department. I mean, what tools do you use? Dealing with political instability in countries where the U.S. clearly has interests. Um, yeah, I think it's a, a. You're correct in the sense that there are inter uh, interlocking interests or overlapping interests and so forth in many many places. Um, I would emphasize that you know we are a, a non-public, non-profit entity, um, so we're not a government entity. We don't follow government policy, um, and our our real mission is to say that the sector cross-border, the international higher ed sector has a joint responsibility because knowledge is international. Knowledge is one, we would say. And so, on the one hand, we don't think it's wise to necessarily um, formally partner with states, which often are part of the problem with pushback. And um, we may get to some of the questions, certainly there's pushback on ideas in every country, including ours. That being said, states and other entities are filled with people. Uh, and the vast majority of people, in my experience, who go into the State Department or other foreign service work also share values that are very common to the values that we have and often want to see the people that we're trying to help, help. And so we have gotten help from embassies and uh, State Department and other governments in different ways and really in very interesting and multi-layered ways over the years. But formally, we would be, would be separate. Um, I don't think there's um, overlap in the sense of redundancy. Um, because no one's trying to exactly carry the ball as far as we are in this population. Um, but there is certainly overlap in ways that we help it. And the way the network works is everything is about partnering. So if we partner with the government on the question of getting a visa, and then we partner with the university on this, and we might partner with an NGO on getting somebody out, and so forth and so on. So everything we have to do is, is through partnering. Yes. What are your main sources of funding? Insufficient. <laughs> <laughs> um, Unfortunately, that's true, but uh, um, our main sources of funding are private uh, grants, mostly. Uh, in the life cycle of NGOs, there are certain sort of phases. Uh, you get your startup money, and probably half to two-thirds end at the end of that. We made it through that, and then you mostly survive on one-year grants, and, and if you're lucky, you start shifting to three-year grants, and so we're in that phase, and now we're looking to broaden our funding base to individual donors uh, more broadly uh, in the professional foundation area. 
Um, universities are asked to make a, a, a subscription, uh, but it's pretty modest, so it's, it's largely symbolic, but a very important piece of our budget. So mostly um, individual giving is our future. International or most of the U.S. funding? Um, interestingly enough, most of the individual giving is U.S., most of the foundation is international. Um, as a but I should say, because I always do, if anyone has any billionaire friends who would like to support the cause, um, I'm totally serious. <laughs> <laughs> anyone else? Sorry, just a What's the geographic scope of your work? For example, you may be in all the countries to do your work in, say, Africa, Asia, perhaps South America. Um, yeah, it's a great question. In terms of the, so there's two sides. It's the need and then the partners in working with it. Um, the need is truly global. Um, so we literally have received requests for help from over 100, I think, in 10 countries. So that means in 110 countries, individuals in the higher education space have self-identified themselves as ethics. Uh, so I think that's pretty extraordinary on the one hand, but then when we unpack it, it makes total sense because the tension between knowledge and ideas is everywhere. Uh, it just manifests in slightly different, more severe or less severe ways. Uh, our membership, the members of our university are, technically the, the members are universities or colleges or research institutes. We now have, I think it's 330 plus uh, in 35 countries. Uh, so that 35 countries is mostly, obviously, North America, Europe, but then increasingly are now pushes to have membership in the global south um, and developing countries. Uh, in terms of partners, um, we try to partner, as I said, with NGOs, with unions, with the sub academic associations, and so forth, and those can be pretty much all over the place. Um, the need is there. Um, we tend to, uh, frankly, avoid engagement with government if we don't have to. That tends to be easier. Uh, but I don't know if I've answered, but so the scope is pretty broad. Is it pretty good idea? Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the first one, I don't actually have a number, and I'm sorry, because what tends to happen in this world is I tend to get asked questions a slightly different way every time, so I don't have that number in my head. So if I haven't calculated the percentage of sort of actually got help across, across the board. Um, the way we tend to work is, um, and one of the reasons is because of the way we tend to work, it's sort of a two-hurdle selection process. So in order, in order to be, for the first hurdle is, do they qualify? Do they get on the list as deserving support? And the criteria for that is, are they a scholar? And are they at risk? And while those two words seem simple enough on the surface, it's actually quite complicated to debate whether they are a scholar or they are at risk. Um, and so, for example, at one point early on, people really, really wanted to uh, simplify this because as you, if you really soak in the mission, it's incredibly broad, uh, foolishly broad, if you actually saw our budget at the beginning. So people were trying to say, how do, we, how do we narrow this down? So one idea came up at our founding conference was, okay, we'll, we'll limit risk that qualifies to people that are targeted specifically because of their academic work. Right? So just because of what they taught, they wrote, they published. Brilliant, right? That makes it clean. I get it. Then you have to show us what you published and why you got in trouble for it. Nice, neat, easy to prove. Somebody raised their hand and said, yeah, um, that means we won't help any physicists. And if people know the history of persecution of scholars, physicists, particularly in Russia, for example, got in a lot of trouble. Uh, and around the world, physicists get in a lot of trouble. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is by the nature of physics, they want to travel. They want to talk to other physicists. They want to exchange information. The nature of physics is it can often be sensitive if you're in the nuclear area, for example. And also because in a lot of places where they don't have the kinds of choices we have into entering higher education, you take a test, and depending on your score, they assign you a discipline. And physics is one of the highest scoring disciplines. So they got a lot of really smart people who didn't really want to be physicists. But they are, right? So those three factors, the physicists tended to be a lot smoker, and a lot of them went to prison. Uh, and so that made us, okay, we can't narrow it that way, because obviously we can't leave out a major segment that we know needs help. So it was hard to unpack that. Basically, the risk side comes down to violent or coercive 
uh, force and it can't be created by the scholar. Uh, uh, on the scholar side, then people say, okay, let's make it easier on the other side of the equation. He said, only people with PhDs. I said, okay, but wait a minute. This is a global program, right? So if you look at who are the teaching and, and even research faculty around the world, the vast majority don't have PhDs. Um, so we couldn't do that. So anyway, so this is, a, this is a way of wandering around to tell you they're tougher questions than look. But basically, once you get over the threshold question, then you're on the list. And then the way the network works is we circulate that list that has a wide range of people on it. So it might have the people who have PhDs who are targeted because of their research and they've been teaching for 30 years. And it might also have somebody who's very junior and is only part-time at the university uh, and is also very engaged publicly and that's part of the reason they're targeted. And the idea is that we have diversity in the network of the members of the university and your community would decide. If we're going to host somebody, that's the first decision. If we're going to host somebody, what department would like to host them? And we want somebody who's junior or senior. Do we want to favor risk or do we want to favor scholarship? Uh, and so I know that makes it messier when I'm trying to describe what we do and how to get involved. But we believe it maximizes the number of people that find positions. Because uh, it would be easy to design a program that is so tightly defined and clear to explain that basically it becomes the Fulbright program or basically it becomes a fellowship to Oxford. But you wouldn't be helping most of the people who need help. So, so the squishiness in my answer, forgive me, is all motivated by trying to help as many people as possible. Yes, here. Um, going back to the geographical scope that you have, how do you go into these countries without causing a red flag through TSA and all those different kinds of things, yeah. you know, with getting to these communities that need Terrific. Yeah. And thank you because you reminded me there was something else I wanted to say in response to this, and that, that connects to it. So um, first of all, I would say uh, uh, we should distinguish our services. Our core service is relocation for somebody who's not safe where they are, keep them working. And that's where all the questions about visas and travel and governments comes in and so forth and so on. And I should say, for the most part, it's not very difficult for us to invite people because for the most part, at least in most well-developed countries, there is a process for inviting foreign scholars. But that's the whole point. We like people to come in and out. And so for the most part, the vast majority of cases of normal international visitors, it's just a question of why they were invited. And so you don't have any problems with visas and those types of things. Um, for our other activities, which is more in-country, trying to change conditions in the country, there, again, we're not really working with government issues there. We're working trying to support local advocates. Right? So I, while well, I actually I do travel a fair amount, we're not necessarily going to all the places we're working in. Our job is not to convert anybody to a new set of values. Behind our work is that these are the values of the higher education space. And one of our strategic advantages as an organization is the higher education space exists just about everywhere. And it's only the most suicidal states that have eliminated it. Right? We can count on less than a hand's worth of fingers. Burma shut down all their universities for a while. North Korea has occasionally really shut them down. A couple of African countries have shut down their one university for a while. But for the most part, the tension is not to eliminate this. And so let me, as a, as a side, let me say, they'd be perfectly happy to get rid of all their human rights activists, right? They'd be perfectly happy to get all their journalists gone, right? All the defense lawyers gone, all the unions gone, right? But they know they can't get rid of the university. So we have a beachhead that's anchored. And that happens to be populated everywhere with at least a couple of people that share these values. Uh, and so our job is to link up with them. How can we reinforce them? So our monitoring project that I mentioned, our monitoring project partners researchers, sometimes researchers here in the US or in Europe, but sometimes they're in the country. And they're the eyes and the ears. And they're sharing the information. And then we're trying to make the information known to a wider community than they could on their own. So, so when you say, how do we get in there? My response is, as a community, we're already there. We're already everywhere. The question is how do we link up? And how do we do that in an efficient way? And how do we honor the local voices as much as we can and be a megaphone for them that communicates their truth to a lot of them? Can you sponsor scholars based on local communities that they receive to help them transition and adapt to the environment? Uh, uh, Yes, so the question was how do we assist the scholars once they're placed, um, services for them, and so forth. Um, partially the answer openly is we, we always know we can do a better job on that and always are trying to do a better job on that. 
and there's an inherent tension in a program like ours. Um, sometimes I feel, at least on our casework side, the way to think of it is I have this picture of the steamships arriving in New York during the waves of immigration. And we're the ones standing next to the gangway, trying to make sure they step over the gap and don't fall in the river, because they've made it so close, and get them to the shore. Right? Your question is what happens? The question is how far do we walk them onto the shore? So there's an inherent tension connected to our budget question of how much staff do you put on one case to keep it going for how long versus when do you accept the new cases and how many uh, and so forth. What we try to do, we try to think again, I guess, for, I don't know why, but I mean nautical example. We think of the program as a lifeboat to get them out of the most dangerous situations so they're not drowning. Uh, and then give them a little bit of time to come up with new opportunities. Uh, and there we have to calibrate it by who it is, how old they are, uh, how good their English is, how traumatized they are. Some people can come out and very quickly adapt to the much more competitive environment that would be here or other places. Some people have a very, very hard time uh, adapting to the, to the new environment. Uh, one guy in the middle, but as, a, as an example, lessons we've learned over the years. Um, we had a scholar from Spain, actually, who came through our program. Uh, so people would say, OK, Spain wasn't on our list of where people are being threatened. Why, why Spain? Anyone want to guess? Basque separatists blew up his car, trying to kill him. The Spanish government wanted him to leave because they wanted him to stay alive and actually paid for a portion of his visit in the United States so he would stay alive. And so we were working with this. And we were trying to teach him that, okay, when your fellowship's ending, he still wasn't feeling safe going home. How does he move on? How does he come to the next phase? And he wasn't particularly emotionally traumatized, but he, he wasn't used to being an American academic. And one of the things was get references. Well, in Spain, all the faculty, or at least at the time, were state employees. So to ask your boss for a letter that tells somebody else to give you a job is corruption. Right? <laughs> but here it's normal. That's a, we call it a reference. But, but in his mind, we were, it, was, it was a form of corruption. Of course, you don't do that. So learning those kinds of things. Over the first 10 years of the network, we, we learned a lot of, by, by error and trial. I guess. Um, we now have some handbooks. So we have a handbook for the scholars that hopefully helps them through some of these. We have handbooks for the host campuses to hopefully help them through it. And then the whole idea behind having a network is to say that, that we are here throughout the process. And so very frequently we'll have a scholar who finishes a fellowship at one place and we try to find a position at the next place. So we're sharing the burden. So no one institution is committing to hosting somebody forever. But if they do their part, as I said, if we each do what we can, and then as a network, we try to piece those together. It makes it very labor intensive, as you could imagine. Um, some scholars, based on their circumstances, we've helped with four or five positions. Um, some scholars are fine after just a short six month visit because their, their risk was low or because they could move on. Is that, that answer? Uh, and sorry, and I should say also just as a, a thank you to, we do get a lot of pro bono help, and we've had pro bono counselors help, and pro bono lawyers help people if they had immigration issues and so forth and so on. And our job as a coordinator is linking up those services as well. Yes. Um, so I think that everybody in this room would agree that protecting uh, academic and intellectual freedom to speak is very important. However, I think that there might be moments in time where there is a necessary intellectual silence in order for the establishment of a stable uh, and safe political order. In your work, have you ever encountered a situation where that has been the case? For example, like a transition in power from one party to the next, has there ever been a time where there's been the necessity for the universal buying into an idea and a lack of dissidence in order to establish a safe regime for the future of that country and those people? Um, you know, I think the challenge in that example, and I understand what you're saying, it's, it's an argument that's out there, is who decides? Who decides what circumstance qualifies, right? Who decides what is the circumstance in which, for this case, we know dissent is a good thing in most cases, but not this case. You know? We know that the scholars are good to have around most of the time, but they shouldn't talk about this. You know? I think that's the real challenge for us. Uh, there are um, laws in some countries that forbid talking about certain topics in certain ways. Right? Armenian genocide, the Holocaust, and so on. Yeah. Again, personal view, not the organizational view. 
uh, and I'm reflecting, I guess, my American legal training, I think it's most important that if you're going to have laws like that, at least acknowledge that these are exceptions to the value. The value is open discourse. Now, if there is a unique personal history in a particular place that for a period of time makes open discourse just too painful or too dangerous, and as an American, I have a hard time accepting that. I admit that. But I respect context, and I respect that I don't know how it feels in other places. Then at least label it as an exception. Don't claim that the rule doesn't cover that when you're bending the rule for it. Can you? So, but I I'm personally would be very suspect because in order to accept that line of argument, I have to accept an authority that gets to decide when. And by definition, every time humanity has done that, I can't think of a time that it's worked out particularly well for the largest number of people. From a student perspective, and, and being able to um, break out of, if you will, in our case, the Augie bubble, uh, taking that responsibility, doing something with it. And from a student perspective, for some of the things that you're, you're talking about, is there a role for students? Absolutely. I mean, students, again, I'm in the human rights community, I guess, or on the edge of human rights. Students are the engine of a lot of the human rights community. So whatever your issue is, and however you define human rights, because it's an incredibly elastic uh, term. Uh, and on the bubble concept, you know, I think fundamentally my story about realizing I lived in a big house was the first pop of a bubble. Uh, and that's the nice thing about bubbles, they pop. All you have to do is poke a little bit, right? Or have somebody poke it for you. Um, I think, you know, that's what the higher education chapter in our lives is. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons repressive authorities are so nervous about higher education. Because they know fundamentally, what are we doing? We, we, we've created a pipeline where we're taking young people, mostly, around the world, not exclusively, we're going and we're channeling them through. We're giving them a chance to ask questions about authority and history and so forth. And ideally, we're teaching them skills to question knowledge that's presented to them without question. Right? So we're giving them their thoughts to be analytic, to ask for evidence of truth, and then go out into the world. And here now, I'm getting back to the answer to your question. The biggest part is take those skills and share them with the people around you. Right? Share them with your family members. How you've asked questions. Why is that their opinion? Where, where, what source are you using for that? And of course, we could have a whole separate class on sources these days, right? Wikipedia is not a source. <laughs> um, so I think part of it is just the fundamentals of higher education. And you can make a difference merely by engaging with your community, and especially across communities, for people that aren't necessarily exactly from where you came from, and try to find out how they think, and why they think that way, and what's the base of that, and being deeply respectful to their perspective and their context, uh, because their context is very, very different. Um, and if you'll indulge me, I'll tell more story. But it's so this work ultimately brought me, not surprisingly, to Israel and Palestine, uh, and I had never been there before. Uh, and I spent two or three days in Israel and Palestine, and the first part I spent in Israel, and I, I had just had a, a magnificent time with wonderfully generous people. And they were brought into their homes, and I met their kids, and I met their families, and, and they were talking about their 15-year-old daughter, who will soon be in the military, and how worried they were for her, and so forth. Uh, and then the next day, I got in a taxi, uh, and I, being ignorant, of course, I just picked any taxi. I didn't realize what taxi I was going to. Turns out I got into a taxi with an Israeli driver, which is fine. So we cruise through the checkpoints, and we get to the university in the West Bank. And there I meet with wonderfully warm, and intelligent, engaging Palestinian scholars. And I get into their home and they meet their children and I eat the food that they've made. And I hear what they're worried about for their uh, children and so forth in their lives. And the lives are so completely different and yet so exactly uh, the same. And then I try to get into uh, a taxi to go home. But of course, I foolishly don't want to get into a Palestinian taxi. And it takes us hours and hours and hours just to get back the ride that took me no time at all. So, so the, the, the engagement in context is my point on is that I realized on that trip, yes, there are human rights challenges and violations here, but there's also an enormous context issue. And it was really eye-opening to me, even though I've traveled a fair bit and engaged on a lot of issues, that context really matters. So as, as young people, as students, pop the bubble when you can, try to understand the perspective and the context that the other is coming from, whatever the other uh, is, 
And don't be overwhelmed by the fact that there are lots of things out there. Again, our, our message in the office is you don't have to do it. But don't do nothing. Do what you can. Now do what you can, and that's all right.